Conway Hall, London, where ethics matter. Good evening and welcome to Conway Hall. We have a room full of people here attending in person and we also have you at home from Zoom. And if you're picking this up later on YouTube, um, you'll be watching it after the fact. This evening we'll be discussing the fact that fascism is not something that we've left in the past, unfortunately. It's a very real and present problem all across the world. We've seen the way that the White House was stormed after the Trump presidency um, incited it, in effect. Um, so uh, Trump supporters storming the Capitol. This evening we've got Paul Mason, we're very lucky to have him. He worked for Channel 4 News and Newsnight uh, and he's written several incisive politics and current affairs books and he's visiting professor at the University of Wolverhampton. His latest book is How to Stop Fascism and that's what he's going to be discussing with us here at Conway Hall this evening. Paul Mason, thank you. Thank you, and um, congratulations to you, uh, the audience, for coming here to Conway Hall, which is always breezy and windy and a little bit chilly uh, on a weekday night. And um, people who I told that I was doing this said, you sure, Conway Hall, middle of the week. But yes, it's lovely, isn't it? And hello to you uh, on Zoom. Um, before we start, before I start talking about my book, I want to just mention something that maybe certainly people in the audi audience may know about, the Zoom audience won't. We're, we're, we're having this meeting in Conway Hall in Red Lion Square, London. And um, it's been a place where radical meetings and sort of atheist meetings have been going on for since 1929. But it is also the site of the first political death by, um, in a riot after the, after the Second World War. So in 1974, the National Front hired this hall, not this one, the big one, to end a march that they were having through London, which was the usual anti-immigrant, racist march. And um, a student called Kevin Gately was on just outside, uh, just by the park railings, and um, got killed. Um, we don't exactly know how. His family believed the police hit him. Um, it's not possible that the fascists hit him. He died two or three days later. And he, Kevin Gately, is the first um, anti-fascist to die since the Second World War in, in the UK. Many of you will know the second one was Blair Peach at the South Hall riot, but Gately often gets missed out. And so I just wanted to mention him and think about that. I was only 14 at the time, but I'll come to this. There was, that political death was really quite important. There was a major inquiry into it by Lord Scarman long before the Brixton riots. Scarman blamed the left for it. Uh, and um, it set the tone for a series of confrontations which certainly were part of my uh, teenage years between the left and the labour movement and the far right. Um, but sadly, we've moved on from all that to something much worse. Uh, but I wanted to mention the, the, the Red Lion Square riot, as it was called at the time. It's just outside. And, and the death of Dick Kevin Gately. There is, I think, a little memorial to him at Warwick University where he, where he studied. OK, so... My first memory of knowing about fascism was when I was about five, um, there was a TV series called All Our Yesterdays. Um, and it was generally a kind of quite a warm, nostalgic series about the past. It was an archive show, I think on ITV. And we were watching it as we did. You, you, there was only one, two channels and you just sat and watched, gawped at whatever was on. And by complete accident, um, started to roll footage of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. Now, if you've seen that footage, you'll know it's the, fame, it's the thing that British people first saw about the Holocaust when it happened in, 19, in 1945. It's the famous footage of, of a bulldozer bulldozing lots of corpses into a mass grave. And um, my mum just leapt up uh, from the, her sofa and switched off the TV and said, we're not watching that, really decisively. Um, and my mum was uh, half Jewish, so her dad had been a Jewish immigrant from Poland or Lithuania and uh, led a fairly glamorous life as a, as a um, dance band musician. 
But she had converted to Christianity to marry my dad, and, but she, she knew during the Second World War, she was five when the war started, what would happen to her if Britain lost. So there was a clear emotional investment in you know, not wanting to see this and not, and I thought, you know, kind of assumed at the time and since then that it wasn't, it, that she didn't want me to see it. But now I realise it was, it was her eyes she was trying to avert from, from this, these facts. Because it's hard to remember now, but after the war, after the Second World you know, some of us have to qualify this now by saying after the Second World War, because there have been so many wars since, after the Second World War, um, there was obviously a widespread uh, feeling that people didn't want to talk about the details, either of their military service or those of them who, that had experienced the Holocaust, about the Holocaust. And this was also quite prevalent among Jewish survivors as well. The word Holocaust was not used. Um, it's only in the 70s that, we, that after the, um, the TV series Holocaust came out that people started to properly name what had happened. And it was also the same in history. Now, just to give you a periodization to think about it, me and my mum in 1965, sitting in our living room, switching the TV off, is about as far from the liberation of Belson as we are from 9-11. So, it's not that far, it's not long. And for that 20 years, there'd been um, what one historian, Roger Griffin, calls um, a babel of liberal incoherence about Nazism, fascism, and the Holocaust. That is, there'd been no proper study on, or historical, theoret historical theoretical thought about it. So people had, you know, when people thought about it, they thought it's something that the Germans did because of the German character. Or it's something that happened because there were a lot of mad psych psych psychopaths running countries. Uh, so the because was also always quite weird, now we think back to, on it. Or it was because mass unemployment took place in the 1930s. But it was around about this time so the mid-60s, um, that historians did begin to overcome this reticence to, to study fascism as a historical phenomenon. And um, the first one was a controversial uh, historian called Ernst Nolte, who in 1963 wrote a book called Fascism in Its Era. In, in English, it's called The Three Faces of Fascism. Now, I think it's, it is a great contribution uh, because he was one of the first to say there is a generic thing called fascism, and Mussolini and Hitler and the French, uh, the French fascist group Action Francaise were all part of this, and we can dis we can study them as a as a whole. That was new at the time. He also uh, went a long way, and I'll, I'll I'll follow him down this in trying to give non-Marxists. A, a definition and theory of fascism that was as all-encompassing and explanatory as Marxism, which will come to Marxism, had a very definite theory of fascism. Um, Nolte ended up in a very dark place because, uh, as a liberal conservative, he actually ended up ten years later beginning to justify uh, what, the, what the Nazis had done on the grounds that it was a, probably a justifiable reaction to Bolshevism. But Nolte, so, that, so, so me and my mum are watching the TV, or not watching the TV, Nolte's writing the first book about, well, what really happened and what, how we, can we compare, and what are the intellectual roots? And this is one thing we must learn from him. He, he says, unlike everybody else who'd said, oh, fascism it was just a bunch of bullshit, you know, ideas drawn together by megalomaniacs. It made no sense. They didn't care what the ideas were. They just collected them like stamps and put them in a book together. Nolte was the first one to realize that there was a staggering logical consistency to the fascist ideology, evil though it was, um, and to write about where that came from, which is, I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey as well, where that came from. But while Nolte was writing, what Nolte's premise was, the great thing is for us, it's dead, it's finished. All possible variants of it are, have been seen. It was a product of its time, as the book's title, the clue is in the title, fascism in its era, which has ended. And therefore, we can now study it as a finished fact, like you can study, say, the Crusades. Uh, so that's a great liberation moment for historians. At the very same time, Somebody else was writing this. Maurice Bardesh, 
French fascist, Holocaust denier, spent his life justifying uh, being collaborator during the war, wrote with another name, another face, and with nothing which betrays the projection from the past, with the form of a child we do not recognize, and the head of a young Medusa, the order of Sparta will be reborn. So Bardesh said, unlike Nolta, actually it may be dead, but it can come back. And it will come back in circumstances that we can't predict, but, and in a form we, the fascists, will not recognize. That was the revolutionary idea that Bardesh had. It, or the, and, it, here's, and here's why he thought it. He said, look, fascism's not about swastikas and concentration camps and uh, torture chambers. Uh, it's about a theory of man and freedom, which can be detached for all, from all those things, certainly from the symbolism, and can revive in other circumstances. And I think the sad thing is, Nolta was wrong, and Bardesh was right. It is reviving, and it has reappeared in the form that I think most fascists in the 1930s would not recognise. We see those people storming the Capitol Hill, the shaman in his, in his horns and uh, furry coat, body painted. Um, you know, that would have been quite hard for, for, for Hitler's stormtroopers to recognise as fascist, but we'll see why um, indeed it has, has come about. So, fascism is back. Um, in the book, I do this thought experiment. What if a bunch of Nazis at the end of the war had been sent to time travel to now to restart the battle for a Fourth Reich? Uh, to cut a long story short, you know, basically, I think they'd just sit back, buy popcorn and watch because there's no need for any time travels from the past. It is back of its own accord. And what I'm going to talk about is why. Um, what it looks like, how we fight it, and why part of it. And this is um, a part of my book that's very important to me, that isn't particularly important to a lot of political activists, but will be very important to anybody who's engaged in the, in the agenda of the, what is now the Conway Hall, it used to be the South Place Ethical Society. It is the humanist ethical response to it. So it's kind of not an accident I'm talking about that. That's what's in the book. I'm not just tailoring it to, to the people interested in, in this place and its, and its ethical um, theories. So when the NF marched to Red Lion Square in 1974, when it marched through London, when we, me, teenagers like me, were involved in fighting them, and I mean fighting them, um, we were dealing then with essentially a tribute band to Nazism. Those of you watching this new BBC TV series, Ridley Road, which deals with the infiltration of the National Socialist Movement, well, they, they had swastikas. Later, the leaders of that evolved into the leaders of the National Front. They put their swastikas away or paraded around in private in their bedrooms. And then they, they, they had the Union Jack. But they were Hitlerites. They, they traced themselves in many, uh, in many senses back to Mosley, Mosley's British Union of Fascists. And many of the skinheads one was chasing up and down the streets of East London, drank in pubs that had been Mosleyite pubs. Their grandfathers had been Mosleyites. There is a British tradition of fascism. Uh, and, it was, and the fascism we were dealing with then was a kind of um, tribute band. I'd say as well, something I'm going to come back to, sometimes my job was as a white working class man with a working class accent to sort of stand, not to do what this woman in the drama does, go deep undercover, but to stand among them and listen to them. And I think they were obnoxious, toxic people, but they were rational. They'd simply had a white supremacist and colonialist view of the world that told them that they were superior and that migrants were going to pollute their country and they were going to do something about it. There wasn't an ounce of what I call today performative self-deception. There wasn't an ounce of irrationalism in them. They were, they were from an organic culture that was just deadly and obnoxious. We'll see why that's changed in a minute. After them, after they were defeated, they would run off the streets by the, the labour movement and migrant communities, and Britain, black British communities, uh, Lewisham and South Hall, etc. Um, they were forced into a right-wing populist 
mode of action. They were superseded by right-wing populism. First of all, the British National Party evolved into an electoral force, leaving aside the whole street politics of the 1970s and 80s, um, and became a kind of sort of old buffers kind of you know, racist party. Um, and it got a million votes in 2009 in the European elections. That was the biggest vote for the BNP, 900,000. Um, and then they were superseded by UKIP. And so the, the 1 million BNP votes were absorbed into the 4 million UKIP votes. And we got a real serious right-wing populism in this country. And we were not alone. The Front National did the same thing in France. Uh, we have um, the right wing of American conservatism by the late 90s was deeply sort of right wing populist. Um, and throughout Eastern Europe, then we had right wing populist parties advancing. And now we have right wing populist governments. We had Trump, who I would argue is a clear right wing populist. We have Erdogan in, in Turkey. We have Viktor Orban in Hungary. We had uh, for temporarily uh, Salvini in Italy and, and, and so on and so on. Um, so right-wing populism was the thing we became concerned about. But as we did, um, numerous political scientists and strategists and pollsters kept telling us one thing. It's not fascism. They, well, you, you can call Farage a fascist, as his schoolmaster did, but he's not a fascist. This is not violent. It's, um, it's anti-democratic in the sense it prefers the will of the people over the rule of judges and the rule of law. But it's not going to abolish elections. And... Um, its nationalism is quite cultural, whereas fascism is, is very, very ethno-centred. And so, you know, even the European Union produced a kind of handy how-to-spot-them guide. Fascist, you can have all kind of fascist here, right-wing populist there, and, and I can buy all that. The problem is that we assumed that this new mass, democratically focused right-wing populism would be a firewall against fascism, that it would absorb all the negative energies and it would divert those energies down a channel where nothing bad could ever happen. So that's the channel of getting four million votes in a uh, European election but never winning a single seat in, in a parliamentary election except once by accident. Um, and the problem is that since the middle of the last decade, so the middle of the 2010s, that's no longer true. The firewall is on fire. That's the problem. The right-wing populism has ceased to be some kind of a, a, a diversion channel for fascism. It is now a, a, a receptacle, an amplifier, an accelerator, an echo chamber for a fascism that has returned. That doesn't mean all right-wing populist parties are fascist parties. Far from it. They still conform to the general typology of peaceful, um, rhetorically anti-democratic, um, basically racist and, and trading on prejudice. That's, I would say that's still the case. The problem we have is that um, for reasons we'll come to, the, the thought architecture of fascism, something I write about in the book, the way fa the, the structured, staggeringly logical theory inside fascism has come to to kind of occupy the minds of people who were previously on, only driven by prejudice. So the example I, I often begin with, actually, is something that happened to me on Whitehall in 2019 during the prorogation crisis. Um, there was people who were mobilised, again, in favour of Brexit and, and in favour of Boris Johnson's shutdown of, of, of Parliament. And um, they came to break up a, a demonstration, a rally I was on with some pro-European, you know, pro-Remain people. And they were quite old, so it's quite possible that we had chased each other through the East End in our teens, and now here we are, well, age 50 and 60, with much bigger and sort of less fit. And, and, and they started shouting at us, and it was only when I replayed what I'd been recording that I realised what they were shouting was, Paul Mason, Marxist, tra traitor to our country, we've researched you. Now, the key word here is Marxist. Traitor is uh, you can live with. What does it mean? It means that p these were people who had a theory of the world where Marxism is suddenly the biggest danger. And it was quite clear, listening to everything else they said, that their, 
that their, their thought architecture had come to mirror that of the American far right. Um, and it was no longer driven by what their dad did in the East End and which pub they drank in and their th who they, whether they supported Millwall. These were theoretical fascists. It, the fascism had come to, to inhabit their thought structures and indeed their, ob their, their obsessions. And what I want to talk to about now is how did that happen? What do fascists do today, in the series of case studies I use in the book, it's quite clear what they do. They do symbolic violence. So if you look at, uh, we saw what happened uh, in, uh, in, on January the 6th to the Capitol Hill. Trump summons a mob. Um, Hannah Arendt's famous description of fascism, the temporary alliance of the elite and the mob, has never been more accurate than on the January the 6th. The elite, you know, Trump's family, all the supermodels who attend them, were all in a tent celebrating that, that they were going to win. Trump's lawyers had been working on Mike Pence to try and give Mike Pence a, a very crazy but, but plausible story about why he personally could cancel the result of the US election. Um, Trump, tell, off script, tells the mob to go to Capitol Hill. There, two pre-prepared groups, the Oath Keepers Militia, which is an armed group, and the Pro Boys, which is a far-right group that is not, often not armed but extremely violent. Um, did the, the, the Pro Boys did the thing of, take, of breaking through the police lines. They were all uniformed and tooled up with um, hard hats and, and, and mace spray. They broke through the police lines, and then once they were in, the Oath Keepers who are a real military militia, did a military manoeuvre, which is where you, one guy grabs on the, the back of the other guy, and they went up through the crowd, broke into the Capitol, and then the, the hapless mob streamed in behind them. That's what happened. Now, symbolic violence, because many of the people thought they were indeed going to seize power and that Trump would remain president. But in a way, you could now read it in a different way. You could read it like this. They showed what you can do. I, I compare this event now to those of you who know um, anything about the American Civil War. There was a precursor event, which was the raid on a place called Harpers Ferry, which was a federal armory by a man called John Brown, who was a radical left-wing uh, preacher against slavery. And Brown said, I'm going to raid this armory. I'm going to uh, give the arms to the black slaves, and there'll be a slave uprising. It was stopped. It was put down. Um, and, and John Brown was hanged, and that's why we're seeing John Brown's body as a mouldering in his grave. Um, but, in a way, he kicked off something bigger, because a year later the Civil War started, and they didn't need a slave uprising, and it was a kind of trigger event. Um, I think this 6th of January could be, instead of a failed and forlorn, ridiculous charade, might end up being the trigger event. Because what is now happening is that Trump has gone back, and pre prepared more mobs, more uh, casus belli for another uh, attempt to, to seize power. His own party has changed the electoral law in 18 states so that the, so that the people who delivered Biden's victory could never vote again, the, 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 the dislocated and precarious Hispanic and black community. Uh, and right now, Texas, by abolishing uh, the right to, effectively the right to free abor to abortion, any form of abortion, and criminalizing abortion provision, um, has begun the process by, by which I think we get to either in 22 or 2020, 2024, uh, another crisis that just like January the 6th, but bigger. And the intention is that they do at that point seize power. But you find this form of symbolic violence everywhere you look when you study fascism. So. Last year, all my examples are from last year. Um, last year, there was a, a, a minor crisis on the Greek-Turkish border when some refugees tried to repeat the, the process of breaking through the border. The Turkish government encouraged them to do so. This attracted uh, people immediately from, from the far right all over Europe. The Greek far right um, armed, armed peasants drove around on tractors and rounded migrant refugees up, took their shoes away and held them at gunpoint until the police could arrive. Also arriving was the leader of the Swedish uh, Democrat Party, which is a technically right-wing populist party, I think quite fascist in its, in its nature. Uh, 
Jimmy Ackerson, turned up with leaflets, go home, get lost, basically standing there telling these, these refugees to go home. But he was a photo op for him. He's a really trendy young guy. Also, Martin Selner, the uh, leader of Generation Identity. Now, this group is much more further to the right. It's been, it, it was the, the group that had received money from the guy who did the Christchurch mosque shooting. So, um, and it's been dissolved because it's been uh, illegalized in several countries. So gen Generation Identity were there. What were they doing? They, what were they doing? They were trying to say, there will be a civil war in Europe between us and the Muslims and the migrants, and it will start here at the Greek-Turkish border, and when it happens, this is where you come. For now, the violence is symbolic, and we could go on. The book cites the, vi the symbolic violence which killed 37 Muslims in uh, New Delhi last year. Trump arrives for a press conference 11 kilometers away, and there is mass murder going on, uh, organized by the BJP party that just happens to be the, 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 the ruling party of India. The BJB's politicians summoned the mob, the mob hit the mosques and the madrasas, and, um, and yeah, it's, it's repeated attempts to use symbolic violence to not just terrify minorities, but to signal what will happen. But what is the purpose of it? What, 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 what is the structure of, of the ideology that we find if we examine uh, the ideas of, for example, some of the radicalized supporters of Bolsonaro in Brazil, the most radical far-right people who support um, uh, Trump, the, the, right -wing, the small right-wing groups here, and of course um, the big penumbra of them which are, have assembled their own conspiracy theories like QAnon. The structure for me has, has a five-part kind of ideology which I'm going to just try and take you through. And, it's, it's the, this is a generic description of what the far right thinks today, and it is different from what they thought in the 1930s. So the, the, the basic idea, point one, number one, uh, bullet point one, of all modern fascism is the great replacement theory, which says that migration is a form of genocide against white people. Now, it's not a new theory. It was in uh, the writings of um, a man called Houston Stuart Chamberlain, uh, who was an advisor to Kaiser long before Hitler. And Houston Stuart Chamberlain said what, the, what Renard Camus, the modern French writer, uh, says today, which is that migrants pollute the gene pool of the white race. The white race is superior because it migrated out of Africa 100,000 years ago, and, uh, and those qualities allowed it to create a better human being. The greatest of all the white races is, are the Nordic peoples, the Northern European Aryans. And um, so, so migration is a form of genocide. Now, if you think about this, it's a disgusting idea, but think about why it's powerful. Because if someone said migration is a bad idea, migration brings people whose food we don't like, that's one thing. If you say migration is going to kill your, your people, that's an entire different thing. It gives you the anger and the permission to do very bad things, which we'll come to. Now, here's the second thing. So, enemy number one is the refugees and migrants and ethnically diverse people themselves. But enemy number one A, slightly different to the 1930s, but very important, is feminism. Because feminism depresses the birth rate of the so-called white race and it, and it encourages the mixing, intermixing of people and it encourages all kinds of activities that don't advocate, don't promote birth of white people which are being you know, lesbians and gays and bisexual transgender people. Um, and um, so Camus, who's the modern theorist of the Great Replacement, believes that if what we're seeing is an invasion as he calls it, of migrate migrants, an occupation of Europe and America by people who shouldn't be there, then using the French uh, resistance as the, as the uh, parallel, the collaborators are the feminists. And who else is the collaborators? Liberals. Because liberals support something else, human rights. So lawyers, liberals, human rights advocates and feminists are the collaborators with the thing that's going to destroy us. Now that's a new thought architecture. If you compare it to, say, Nazism with its obsession with Jews, we'll come to where, where this fits in. So that's point two, feminists are the enemy and liberals are the other. Point three 
is somebody has to be organising this. Because as in all forms of conspiracism, it, you cannot look at a, an objective fact and believe it's spontaneously arisen from society. You have to believe that someone has planned it. And in the new fascist arch thought architecture, that person who has planned all this is the cultural Marxist. Now, cultural Marxism is an idea um, invented by the, the American far-right conservatives in the 1990s. And it says it's a wacky theory. Those of you who know anything about the history of thought may think it's crazy, but the, here's the, here goes. Um, that when the new left in the 1960s realised that the working class were going to fail in their historic mission to overthrow capitalism, they decided to overthrow capitalism by undermining Western society through social liberalism. So through feminism, through lesbian and gay rights, through um, mixed marriages and the rest. And modern art, you, punk rock, you name it. So, so cultural Marxism is the work of the Frankfurt School, the Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, uh, Walter Benjamin, etc., um, Herbert Marcuse, all the people we studied in the 1960s and 70s at university. They are to blame because they have a plan, and their plan is to destroy the West through migration and feminism. And this is very interesting because it, it exactly mirrors, of course, the, 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 the Nazi term, Kultur Bolshevismus, cultural Bolshevism, and it means exactly the same. Because for the Nazis, the real problem wasn't actually the Jews. I mean, it, they were the problem, but the problem the Nazis had was with cultural leftism, and they then, in their thought architecture, there was a carrier of this disease, and the carrier of the disease was the Jewish people of Germany. So, the, so we now see the very similar structures in the, in the ideologies put forward by the far right. That cultural Marxism is the, is the enemy, the carrier of it is the social justice warrior. So if you look at SJWs, as they're, as they're called derogatively in, on, on far-right websites, SJWs are often depicted as uh, non-binary, you can't tell whether it's a man or a woman, uh, slovenly, uh, pe diseased people. So the cultural Marxist is point number three. This is the person who's planned it all and is executing the destruction of you, your society. Right, what do you do about it? Point four. Point four, what do you do about it? You don't seize power. You don't march on Rome as Mussolini did. You don't march from a beer keller into a police uh, cordon and get shot at as Hitler did in 1923 in a beer hall putsch in Munich. You don't do that. You wait and you prepare and you do what they call metapolitics. You do, you do cultural politics, you do symbolic violence, you, you spread the word, you hang on and infiltrate every movement that is likely to, to make people angry with the society they're in. In 9-11, it was Islamophobia. Since 9-11, it was Islamophobia. From 2008 onwards, it was anti-austerity, so, you know, anti-elite, anti-globalization, anti-financial elite politics. Now, one of the people who monitors these far-right websites was telling me last week at Labour Party conference, he is convinced that it is num the number one anger stimulant is now trans rights. And so the, the, the attack on the so-called gender ideology is what they do. All they do is pick a thing and then latch onto it and amplify it so that they can bring people into the metapolitical universe of studying this stuff, studying these ideas the Great Replacement, anti-feminism, and all the things I've just said. That's point four. Because point five is the, the, their objective. Their objective isn't a Third Reich. Their objective isn't a greater Germany. Their objective is a global ethnic civil war. The outcome of which is a series of monocultural ethno-states which are, cover large areas. They have bought the whole theory of, of the Nazi jurist Karl Schmitt who's quite popular in liberal circles today, who believed that large spaces need single governments. And large spaces with single governments must have homogeneous peoples. There can be no uh, heterogeneity, political, ethnic, any heterogeneity in a successful society. So basically these guys are overt, before the fact, advocates of genocide. This is, this is um, the sad 
fact, I have to you know, tell you that if a Sturmabteilung guy sitting in 1932 in Berlin and having a beer, unemployed, may have thought and fantasised about getting rid of Jews. They didn't know how to do it. They didn't know that it, can, it could be done on an industrial scale. Every Nazi, every far-right activist knows it can be done and wants it to happen. And they are thinking not in millions, they're thinking in billions. The Finnish uh, so-called eco-fascist, Penti Linkola, believes the, the Earth can only support about half a billion to a billion people. Those people should be white and Northern European. And he never quite spells out what should happen to the other six billion. So six billion, not six million. But he does say in his book, who misses the Jews who died in the Holocaust? So these people are really serious. And, uh, uh, not only really serious, different. Their ideology is, as Nolte quoted about the original fascism, staggeringly coherent. It's just bullshit and horrible, but it is coherent. And therein lies its danger. Because I think it is highly likely that the climate change is going to give them this day X, as they call it, the, the Kraken, the storm, the day when Western society uh, faces like, like um, a moment of, of breakdown. And so they're entirely logical and rational to be waiting and prepping. The prepping, as it's called, preparing, again, 2020, all my case studies from one year, 2020, the German police busted a 25-strong organisation called Nordkreuz, which consisted mainly of ex-service and ex-police. It had a 25,000-long uh, death list uh, for when the day X arrives. And uh, all those names have been taken from a police computer. And it was left-wing politicians, lawyers, human rights activists, and feminists. Uh, so, now, what, now that's what they believe. People on the right wing of politics, people on, um, in, involved in UKIP and the Brexit party, don't have to believe this. Most of them don't believe it. But here's the problem. The, 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 the logicality and coherence of this idea set is exerting a kind of magnetic force on all of the far right thinking. So you see it, for example, in the, you've got to learn to see it in the way radical right-wing people and even right-wing conservatives start to talk. So if you look at what happened, two examples. What, one example is, is oh, I'll come to this. One example then. This year, the conser parts of the Conservative Party started to basically tacitly advocating, booing the, British, the English football team. Because they said it's, it's not wrong to boo them because what you're booing against is the import of an effectively alien practice into our culture. And so that, once you read the opposition to taking the knee through the lens of this theory, it makes sense. Because what you're saying is that um, it's not you know, Marcus Rashford and, and, and all the other people who, who we object to, but they are carriers of an of a non-British practice into our British culture and we, you are right if you want to object to it and boo it. So you can even see the reflection of the way this works and then who's in favour of it? The Liberals. You know, so they're bringing the other into our culture as well and it's going to do something to our culture. It's going to pollute it because before we used to be able to make racist monkey chants and nobody bothered, did they? We, we just got away with it. Um, so. So the structure of the ideology is, is changing both right-wing populism and conservatism. Now, at the very centre, so, so what does that mean for, the, for, for what fascism is, for, 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 for what it is as a different phenomenon? First, it's not nationalist anymore. If you want a global ethnic civil war, you cheer on everything that brings on the international civil war. And the American fascists, last month, in August rather, to a person, spontaneously, without any di direction from above, all cheered the victory of the Taliban. Because they said they've defeated the gay American government, the Zionist American government, as they call it. Number one, that's our enemy. Two, we share what they want. We're anti-feminist, we're anti-modernity. We want to roll back modernity. In, in the case of the Russian uh, fascist Alexander Dugin, he wants to he quite happily see a hunter-gatherer society. 
uh, back. Um, Goebbels only wanted to roll back history to 1789. Uh, the new fascists are quite happy to go further. And the Taliban, they see us doing it. Um, so, you know, a classic American fascist would have been a pro-American, but not anymore. They, they, these people just want what destroys Western society. The other part of it is the, 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 the centrality of irrationalism. That, that, that they see um, rationalism the university, um, the media, as speaking ex cathedra without, without um, justification. And that they, are, they revel in the rise and return of irrationalist modes of thinking, uh, which, uh, many of which are expressed through, through conspiracy theories. Um, a third thing is, for those National Front people who marched in this square in 1974, the main conduit into far-right politics was personal, it was historic, it was cultural, their, their family, their friends. Today, net, the network is the conduit. Uh, you, can, you can meet other fascists and you can begin to act online like a, a virtual swarm of thousands attacking this person, this public figure, this feminist thinker, um, without leaving your bedroom. But Anti-feminism, or another word for it might be violent misogyny, um, is a very powerful route into fascism in a way that it wasn't either in the 70s or even in the 1930s. Because here's why. If you're going around saying, a migrant's taken my job, often a migrant hasn't actually taken your job. Uh, a lot of racists would like to hit a black person, but very few of them ever do. They, you know, they, they, they don't have the courage to, to go and do it. Do it. Every violent misogynist has hit a woman. And what is more, every man who says a woman has taken my rightful place in the sexual hierarchy of the old world is probably right. You know, the incel movement and the um, beta movement, the so-called beta rebellion, these are men who believe they are beta males, not alpha males, and that their role is naturally subservient to alpha males. You know, who, who knew these idiots existed, but they do. Um, they're naturally subservient to alpha males who should get all the prettiest girlfriends, but the other girlfriends should be left for them. And the big problem in the world is that women won't sleep with them. That's, that's kind of a huge source of male anxiety and violent thought. It's everywhere on the internet. If you have a teenage son or grandson, he will have come across it without any shadow of a doubt. Um, that's a really strong motivator and uh, conduit into fascism in a way that it wasn't, because Hitler and Mussolini didn't have to deal with a generation of, lim of partially liberated women and the pill and uh, human rights leg and equality legislation. They just didn't have to deal with it. So that's, those are the differences between then and now, and I think it makes fascism possibly uh, more virulent. virulent. What do we do? Well, actually, this is the easy bit. Um, with the individuals, there are lots of um, strategies now uh, um, developed by counter-extremism, counter-radicalization uh, professionals, and they've been, they've been deployed against Islamist uh, terror and, and extremism, and they kind of work up to a point. It's, you've got to sympathize with their fear and mistrust of authority. You can't just say, but, you know, the Prime Minister said, said it, so it's right. Or a scientist said it, so shut up. You've got to be able to sort of give them roots out that, that, that say, yes, maybe the world is all wrong. And maybe, maybe there are problems uh, that, that need to be deal, dealt with. And maybe sometimes the state does lie to you. But don't lead down the rabbit hole of full-blown conspiracy. That's on a personal level. That's how de-radicalisation people work. Some, the other thing is pre-bunking, instead of debunking. So somebody says, right, um, the world, Britain is ruled by a class of lizard aliens from outer space, this is David Icke's theory, um, and that's why they're trying to make you take this vaccine, which is either a, a, a 5G chip that they're trying to implant into your arm, etc. No. The way to deal with that is to not wait for, some, for your grandma to, to come off Facebook and say these things, but for politicians to say, vaccines work. There is no lizard alien class running the world. Um, 
QAnon is rubbish. QAnon is a modern version of fascism. And anybody who tells you it's right is spreading far right ideology. How many politicians do you hear do that? None. Because they're terrified. They're terrified of admitting that so many of their constituents are going down this route, the rabbit hole of conspiracism. But pre-bunking is the other thing to do. So the, the, the sort of basic thing is that. But the political thing was taught to us by the 1930s generation. And some of whom sat in this hall and did exactly what I'm going to say and do. The only time the alliance of the elite and the mob was ever defeated was by a political alliance of the centre and the left. You might be a liberal, you might be a socialist or a far left person, but you may not like that, but that's what happened. When the left and the centre were fighting each other in the early 30s, the fascists won in every country where that happened. They won in Austria, uh, they won in Germany, they won uh, in Italy in the 20s. And in every case, the left had a theory of its own invincibility. I don't just mean small left groups. Mass Marxist parties taught their, own, taught their members the, of their own necessary victory and invincibility. Uh, and therefore, that, that, that liberalism would die, liberalism was useless and could be ignored. And anyway, it was the enemy, the main enemy. Um, in fact, in Germany, for the communists, it was socialism was the main enemy. The Communist Party taught its five million voters that um, seven or eight million socialist voters were really fascists and as bad as Hitler. So as long as that carried on, bang, 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 Austria 1934, same thing, defeat after defeat. The moment came where, and I describe it in the book, there's a whole chapter about it, where a complete maverick French communist decided enough um, fascism was looking uh, likely in France. There were tens of thousands of armed and, uh, and uniformed fascist leagues. They'd stormed Parliament unsuccessfully in a strange parallel to, December, to, to January the 6th. And uh, this guy said, no, they, I've had enough. We are going to make a united committee of the socialists, the communists and the liberals in this area, Saint-Denis, northern Paris, and we are going to fight back. Um, now, for those of you who know this strange story, he, within four years, became a fascist himself. But not before, completely disrupting the, because he was an egotist and he just wanted power, but he did completely disrupted the left's way of thinking, Jacques Dorio. Um, and he formed what became the Popular Front. He formed this committee of liberals, socialists, trade unionists and artists. Um, and they started to work together. Within two years, they had a formal agreement between the Liberal Party, the Socialist Party and the Communist Party to form a government. They defeated the right and the far right and they formed a government and it unleashed a big mass strike wave, which it then bought off. Um, and it unleashed, far more important from my point of view, a mass cultural movement against fascism. So that the idea of anti-fascism rather than socialism, communism or liberalism became the thing in the 30s so by the, by the time Picasso is painting Guernica, Jean Renoir is making his iconic movies in the middle of the 30s, uh, by the time J.B. Priestley or Orwell are writing their anti-fascist works of literature, there is, parche the title of this place and this, and this talk, an ethos of anti-fascism. That the writer Enzo Traverso, a modern day anti-fascist writer, believes was critical to turning the tide in Europe against fascism. So the, the idea of a, of a temporary alliance of the centre and the left, which unleashes a cultural movement against fascism and a political alliance uh, which can defend democracy, I think is just axiomatically what we're going to have to do. The second thing, not so popular, especially in places like America or even here, where we have a quite liberal left, is we're going to need anti-fascist laws. One of the other people I've dug up, as it were, from the 1930s was a German... Jewish jurist called Karl Lowenstein, who fled Germany in the mid-30s, went to Yale and wrote a, an influential essay called Militant Democracy. Lowenstein argues that the purpose of democracy is not to facilitate fascism, it's to suppress it. And we need to think about democracy in that way. So he said, fascism just exploits the weaknesses in democracy. You know, uh, fascists in Belgium would win an, a by-election, go into Parliament, resign the seat and call a new by-election over and over again. They would take money from foreign sources, they would uh, amass arms all over Europe, um, stocks of arms, 
Lois Sin said, just said, well, if you want to stop fascism, what you do is you just pass laws that say you can't use the by-election system in that way. There are no by-elections. Uh, you can't march with, in a uniformed group. Cable Street, which we celebrated the 85th anniversary of um, this week, was a uniformed march by Oswald Mosley's fascists through Cable Street in the East End. Uh, the next year, they did a similar march through Green Street in, um, in Southwark, uh, non-uniformed, because the 1937 Public Order Act banned uniformed marches. And so Lowenstein said, it's tough because we are democracies, but if we want to keep democracy, we've got to pass laws that make some things that fascists do explicitly illegal. And one of them is, and I think should be, being a fascist party. The Proud Boys, who I mentioned in, this, in the context of this January the 6th, are banned in Canada. You cannot be a Proud Boy and march around in your Fred Perry shirt and your uh, yellow kilt, this the weird uniform they have. It's just illegal. Cross the border into America, it's totally legal. And I think that makes the American Constitution, with the First Amendment, total, uh, total sort of permissiveness towards free speech, and the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, it's, one of, it's a lethal combination. If you can, avoid it. If you can, as the Germans do, you have laws that say it is illegal to be a fascist or proto-fascist group. And they said to the AFD, Alternative für Deutschland, which I would class as a right-wing populist party, it's got um, 70 odd MPs and about 7 million voters. Um, they said, right, okay, right-wing populist, we don't like you, you're legal, but there's a wing of this party that is on a route towards Nazism, using Nazi ideology and symbolism. You are now being classed as an extremist group. Every one of you is now under surveillance by the police. Okay, what are you gonna do? They dissolved, they no longer exist. Their, their thoughts still exist, but their organizational form cannot exist in Germany. I think we should do that. So that's point two, anti-fascist laws. Tough though it is to think about how you do it. Um, but the most important thing, beyond all that for me, is we need to adopt and rekindle and fight for and be proud of an anti-fascist ethos. If you watch the movie Casablanca, that movie was, the, out of 14 named actors, only three are American. Of, most of the people on the set were refugees from Europe. It's a movie um, co-created, not just by the scriptwriters, the left-wing well, communist scriptwriter, Howard Koch, and the liberals, uh, the Epstein brothers. It, it was co-created on the set by people who'd lived fascism. The croupier, if those of you know the movie, the croupier in the, in the casino, Marcel Delio, the actor, comes out and he says, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Rick, somebody has just won $20,000, and he, he does this with his bow tie. He was the most famous Jewish actor in uh, France, and when the Nazis occupied France, they put Dalio's face on a poster, and it just said, Jew. This is what a Jew looks like. Dalio escaped. Um, with his wife, who's the, who's the Yvonne at the bar, the, the flighty bar fly. Um, they'd escaped on, on fake visas, just like the people in Casablanca do. What Casablanca is about is a person who's fought fascism and failed, Rick, and he looks at the world and he's fed up and, and cynical, and events take place that make him confront the necessity of fighting again. Um, to take an ethical choice. When he takes an ethical choice, everybody in the bar, everybody in the casino, even the corrupt policeman who's you know, trading visas for sex, um, has to take an ethical decision as well. And to finish here, we're in quite a poor place as, as a left to start to begin a discussion about what an anti-fascist ethos is. And the reason for that is, as a secular left and a secular liberalism, Neither of us really has very much of an ethical vocabulary. I'd say that liberalism probably does have more an ethical, ethical vocabulary arising from the theories of social justice uh, pioneered by John Rawls in the 70s. But the left I come from gave up discussion as of eth ethics. Marxism laughed at moral philosophy. Marxism said, you know, ethics is impossible. You know, what does Nancy in, um, in Oliver Twist need with an ethic? You know, an ethical code, of, she, she can't have one. But the working class did, in the 19th and 20th centuries, I would argue, did have an ethos. And it was what we call class consciousness. Class consciousness, I argue, in this book and in my previous book, was indeed a form of Aristotelian ethics, which, which asked, what does a good society look like and what does a good person in that society do? That's what my granddad's generation thought they were doing when they said, you know, strike breaking is wrong. You know, 
uh, pit head baths are right. You behave to each other in a certain way, and if you don't behave in that way, you meet the, the, the floor of a pub very rapidly. Um, that was a very rough hewn ethical system. But here's the problem, and I'll finish with this. Hannah Arendt understood this, that if you, don't, if you have a kind of rough hewn ethical system, which is spontaneous and doesn't have a, a, a language of moral philosophy, what's missing? What is missing is your concept of evil. My granddad and grandma's generation had a concept of evil. It, war was evil to them. They'd seen the First World War. Strike breaking was evil. Fascism was evil. But they, they, could, they could never imagine how evil it was going to get. They had no way of manipulating concepts in their minds to understand that when someone says, I'm going to kill six million people, using no, no more than ten concrete boxes, that they mean to do it. And that in the minds of those people, there's a complete dehumanisation of the victim. So that, as uh, Marion Tursky, a survivor from Auschwitz, I can remember an interview I did with him three years ago, where he said, to us, they were bugs. And he says, what do you do with a bug? Like that. I mean, this guy had survived Auschwitz. He'd survived beatings, he'd survived torture. He said, that's what was in their minds. <laughs> that. That's how they think of us. And we, he'd seen it. But my granddad's generation, who were, you know, he's from the same generation, they couldn't imagine it because they had no concept of what Anna, Hannah Arendt, after the fact, revived Kant's doctrine of radical evil. An evil that is not. You see, I suppose in Christianity is the same as in this South Place Ethical Society. Uh, they had a concept of evil that was kind of, when human beings do wrong, they're less than human. You know, when, when we rape or murder, they're human scale crimes. We regress to an, an animal kind of instinct. That's what most Judeo-Christian Islamic thought and even ethical you know, humanism thinks about when it thinks about evil. It's a small scale, less than human it's, it's just a failing to be human. Arendt realised that there is something else. Where we can discuss what breeds it. Is it class society? Is it a much deeper fear of freedom that is in, ingrained within us in all forms of class society? She says that we've got to get our heads around the fact that 20th century produced a form of evil that simply saw human beings as dispensable. And she says, and it's something I think that is very true, of a lot of the people I study and watch on the far right, the deep activists. It's not just that they didn't care whether their victims lived or died. They didn't care whether they themselves ever lived or had ever existed. This is the, what we call the black pill. The, it's, uh, the, the black pill terminology in modern fascism is, you know, the red pill is the pill you take to, like in the Matrix movie, to realise that, the, that your white men are the most oppressed people in the world and that feminists are the oppressors. The black pill is what you take when you realise it's hopeless and that you, feminism's won, Marxism and cultural Marxism have won, Paul Mason's standing in Conway Hall on Zoom and everybody's listening to him. What you do is you black pill, is you take as many people with you and you take yourself away. Now, at the moment, we're just seeing people like the guy in, in Plymouth, took five people with him. Uh, he was very clearly part of that incel culture. The guy who went, shot the, the, the Christchurch mosques, took 60-odd people with him. Uh, the person who shot, in 2020, nine Kurdish people in a, in a coffee shop in Hesse, took nine people with him. But these people mean to take a lot of people with them. And uh, that... I think is the huge challenge to those of us who live in the ordinary world of ordinary sin, ordinary misdemeanor, ordinary evil, is to get our heads around what happens when the radical evil comes. And I think um, I finished the book with a, an account of my trip to uh, Majdanek, the, the concentration camp. If you've never been to one of the monuments, Auschwitz, Majdanek, Sobibor, do, do go. No matter how much you think you know about fascism, it's always worth just standing there and contemplating what it might have been like for the people who had to endure that. And I wondered, after that lifetime of my mum saying, don't watch this, you know, I'm sure my mum wouldn't have wanted me to go to a place like that. She didn't want me li reliving the past of distant Jewish relatives. Um, if, and, and experiencing the pain. But I think it's absolutely necessary because when I came out of that room, 
No bigger than this, by the way. Thinner than this, about the length of this. Um, how did I feel? I, I felt anti-fascist. And I hope you would too. Thank you.